Thanks, Liz. I think it's really salutary to think not just about what we do, what the work is, but how we do it, and how we organise ourselves. And Collective Impact provides a great forum for exploring those ideas. So thanks. And Liz's workshop this afternoon will uh, develop much more of those ideas as well. Uh, and slider questions are coming in. There was a question about how do you identify a champion to begin work in a collective impact setting. So we might explore that in the discussion at the end. Uh, we welcome now Pro Associate Professor Luke Wolfenden, uh, who's from the School of Public Health and Medicine at Newcastle University. Uh, Luke is also the Program Manager for Population Health within the Hunter New England Local Health District. Um, so please welcome Luke. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the invitation uh, to present. I'll just start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today and paying my respects to elders past and present. I also wanted to pass on um, the apologies of John Wiggers, who um, couldn't actually be here today, but very much wanted to be. So health promotion is often talked about as an art and a science, and today in my presentation I'll largely be talking to you about how we use evidence to inform uh, good health promotion policy and practice, but I'll also touch on the role of, I guess, the art in how health promotion practice is done, and how we might merge both the science and the art together uh, to get good health promotion outcomes for our community. So why is evidence important for health promotion? So it serves a number uh, of objectives for health promotion policy and practice. Um, most importantly, it tells us whether a planned health promotion policy or program is actually going to be effective. And so we can look through the scientific evidence and quickly find um, a, a program or evidence regarding the effectiveness of a program or policy to meet our specific objectives. It can also stop us from implementing a policy or program that science tells us will not work, and that's equally um, as, as a beneficial outcome. While science is pretty good at identifying effective policies or programs or practices, um, it's also used, but not as good, at identifying unintended consequences of health promotion interventions. And one of the things that we should be using scientific literature for, despite its limitations, is give us a heads up about any unintended consequences or any harms that might arise from what we are doing, despite the best of intentions. And medicine and public health are littered with examples of uh, unintended harm occurring as a result of health and medical intervention. Uh, we used to give pregnant women fluidohyde to treat their, uh, uh, their morning sickness until we discovered that it caused uh, birth uh, uh, defects. Uh, we, uh, many of the, the sexual abstinence programs are still being used in schools in the US today. We now have an unintended consequence of um, increasing the risk of uh, unwanted teen pregnancy um, and uh, STI infection. Probably for me, one of the most salient professional experiences I had was immediately after my PhD. Um, I went to work for an organisation called the Cochrane Collaboration in the UK. And Cochrane uh, uh, package evidence for health promotion, um, public health and medicine decision making. So they synthesise science and they send it to policymakers and practitioners so that they can make good quality um, evidence based decisions. And I arrived at Cochrane just after the Boxing Day tsunami, and at that time there was a convergence of non government organisations and government agencies in places like Sri Lanka um, and Indonesia looking to do the best for their community and providing um, uh, behavioural counselling and mental health intervention for people who had just experienced um, significant trauma. And what we knew at the time from scientific evidence was that was one of the worst things that you could do for people, um, despite that being um, delivered out of, with good intentions of wanting to help people. Um, asking people to relive trauma and recount um, stories that are quite traumatic immediately after it occurs uh, without the opportunity for them to process it actually does more harm than good. So we were quickly developing these evidence summaries and getting them into um, you know, remote areas and to, to um, public health clinics as quickly as we could to make sure that kind of practice um, didn't, didn't occur. So using science to get a sense of unintended consequence is uh, really important for quality health promotion. And finally, we use scientific evidence to assess the cost and the relative cost of interventions. 
So we live in a, a world with finite resources and any organisation of any size should be looking to maximise the benefit that they can provide to their community with the resources that they've got. And so we often compare the effects of interventions with the cost of interventions and that lets us whittle down uh, possible intervention options so that we can pick the intervention that's most cost effective and can do the most benefit with our fixed health resources. And so, what is scientific evidence? It's not merely information, and it's not evidence in a legal sense. So in a court of law, <coughs> someone's testimony, so their perspective or opinion, counts as, counts as, as evidence. Um, but scientific evidence is generated through experimentation. So we actually run experiments, and we have a look at the outcome of those experiments, and we use that as the basis for scientific practice. So as scientists, what we do is we, we, we um, once we, we do our experiments, we, we form what we call levels of evidence. Um, and that gives us a sense of how confident we can be with the current scientific evidence base. So level, at level one, what we call level one evidence, uh, we can be quite certain of the findings from that literature. And that's basically where we do a systematic review of all the research studies, all the experiments that have been done on a particular issue. It could be alcohol, a school-based alcohol education. And um, we get all that evidence together and we pull all the data and we can come to a, a, a quite a, uh, an accurate estimate of the effect of that kind of policy or program. The next level, or level two evidence, we derive from high quality experiments or what we call randomised controlled trials. And we can be very confident in the findings of that research. Level three evidence is what we call uh, evidence generated from low quality experiments. So these experiments that don't use random assignment and they uh, are often subject to some bias. And so we have to be very careful about making policy or program decisions based on low quality experimental evidence. And finally, level four uh, evidence is based on observations or association studies. So just when, through data collection, we know when A happens, B tends to happen as well. But again, that can um, be quite misleading and, and so often we like to really be making health policy and practice decisions based on level one or level two evidence only. So what we don't consider scientific evidence is the opinion of experts, individual experience or case reports. So that, we, um, as a scientist, um, we like to avoid making policy or program decisions based on um, those, those opinions alone. So I'll just walk you through now what uh, the evidence base for interventions to reduce alcohol misuse and harm. So this is a review that was published in 2010, so it's a little bit old now, um, but the conclusions have largely remained the same um, in the, the, the seven years since. Um, and this text, which is called Alcohol No Ordinary, no Ordinary Commodity, it was published by Bayer and has been used by the World Health Organization to guide alcohol policy and practice. Um, the review uses this key here, so basically the more plus signs there, um, the, the, more, uh, the greater the effectiveness of that intervention is according to the Baylor review. If it's got a zero there, then there's good evidence to say that that intervention isn't effective, and if it's a question mark, um, Baylor's suggesting that we need more research. So in terms of taxation and pricing, there's really strong evidence that alcohol taxes reduce alcohol intake, excessive alcohol intake and alcohol related harm. We're not sure about setting minimum prices for alcohol and there's some, some evidence to suggest that differential prices on alcohol by strength, so having uh, low or mid strength alcohol cheaper than full strength alcohol um, is effective and targeted uh, taxes such as the alcohol pop tax that was introduced a few years ago now. There's good evidence for a variety of supply um, regulation strategies, particularly the ban on sales of alcohol, for example, in certain communities or at events. Restrictions um, by strength of alcohol are effective, as are minimal legal purchasing age, restrictions on the hours and days of sale of alcohol, uh, and on outlet density, so including both uh, off-license and on-license alcohol premises. In terms of bans on drinking in public places, there's still not uh, enough evidence to suggest that's an effective approach. In terms of modifying the drinking environment, um, responsible service of alcohol training policies and provisions, 
we're reasonably confident that actually doesn't work unless it's enforced. Um, aggression or management training, there's a reasonable evidence to support as there is enhanced enforcement of liquor laws um, and server liability. Voluntary codes of practice from industry um, research suggests doesn't work um, and there's still a uh, question mark on late night lockouts so I, I believe now that evidence is, is strengthening. In terms of drink driving countermeasures, uh, random breath tests are effective as is uh, lowered uh, blood alcohol concentration uh, and license suspensions and lower blood al alcohol concentration for young drivers is, is effective. Designated driver programs don't appear to be effective and in fact there's some, um, uh, this, there's some evidence suggests that actually can have an unintended harmful effect um, by increasing excessive consumption amongst those who aren't the designated driver or by road safety issues for people who are uh, for the designated driver when they're um, very intoxicated uh, people back to their house. There's very little evidence to support, particularly in isolation, the use of education and persuasion strategies. So this is curricular-based interventions in schools, mass media campaigns, warning labels and social marketing strategies. So it's a goal here is to reduce alcohol-related harm in isolation. These kinds of strategies generally don't work. From a treatment and early intervention perspective, so this is about providing you know, uh, medical intervention for people who are um, at risk or are current problem drinkers. Uh, we know that brief interventions with at-risk drinkers are effective, as are medical detoxification facilities. There's some evidence to support um, self-help interventions and mandatory treatment of repeat drink drivers. Again, social marketing interventions for these groups. Um, don't work. And there's some evidence to support restrictions implemented by accords or other community based programs, um, but other kind of community based events would need more research. <coughs> so I've just kind of whipped you through the current ev evidence base regarding alcohol based interventions. Um, but along with evidence, we need to consider a range of other factors when we're selecting interventions for us to use with our community. Um, and this is really about, can the selected program or policy or intervention be appropriately implemented within your existing resources and capacity? Any intervention that requires a legislative change requires political will and often political capital. And politicians can be very wary about spending political capital and often, uh, you know, the moons need to align in order for a politician to take up that course. And so timing for legislative change um, is particularly important. Any intervention that require, that, it, that is uh, opposed by community and key stakeholders, particularly when that's the majority, can be quite a difficult intervention uh, to get across the line, up and running. Um, interventions will often require infrastructure, workforce skills and resourcing requirements, so you need to make sure you consider whether you have the, those, um, that infrastructure and resources before you select that program. And we need to consider who these interventions will reach um, and how many people they'll reach. Obviously we're wanting to uh, reach as much as we can the people who are most at risk and as many of them as possible. And finally, tapping into existing systems or an effective intervention approach or they provide an effective mechanism to deliver um, alcohol and other drug interventions. Not only because there's already infrastructure already existing, um, but they provide interventions that are typically more sustainable and often aren't relying on you always being there to provide that uh, intervention and support. And so there are a variety of information sources and techniques that can be used to help you, um, uh, to help inform such decisions. Um, but they are typically not the result of experimentation and so typically don't fall within that um, evidence hierarchy that I mentioned before. Okay, so how do we kind of marry these, this, this art and the science? Well, we typically do it through these kinds of decision planes, and anyone familiar with these kinds of decision planes or decision grids are used across a variety of disciplines. Um, people uh, who have a history in business would be, would be familiar with these kinds of approaches. But basically we can use the scientific literature to do a reasonable a job of plotting the effectiveness of a policy or program across the horizontal plane there, 
and often we have to use our judgment regarding how implementable that policy or program is going to be um, down the vertical plane. And what we're looking for is that we want to select interventions that we know are going to be effective, so there's good scientific evidence that these things work, and we know that, that we are able to, um, in isolation or in partnership and collaboration with others, able to implement them relatively easily. So they're kind of our best buys, and they should be the subject of most of our attention when we're um, developing and, and selecting interventions. And we really should be avoiding any interventions where there's you know, no real evidence of effect, or there are marginal effectiveness, and of which we have little control over. So they're you know, very difficult for us to implement. Sure. So I guess in conclusion, you know, evidence is really a fundamental pillar of effective health promotion. You know, we, we shouldn't really be doing health promotion without um, careful consideration of the current evidence base. However, best practice health promotion really makes use of not only evidence, but other information sources. Um, they give us a, a sense of how appropriate, how feasible, how acceptable implementing various strategies are going to be. There's little value in investing in initiatives that have been found to be ineffective um, in achieving a stated program objective, as there is little value in investing in initiatives that we don't have the capacity to implement. Now, th these types of policy or program selections are, are really going to be little value to your community. And often I find, you know, when we do this kind of um, health promotion planning work uh, within the health service that, I, that I'm part of, often the problem that we run into is that our aspiration uh, is often exceeds our capacity. And so we start with a, an objective of reducing our correlated harm across Newcastle or reducing the prevalence of a particular um, our health behaviour at a population level. And often when we look at the evidence, uh, the interventions that are effective in achieving that kind of level of impact are really beyond our, our own capacity and beyond the capacity of, of us even uh, when we work in collaboration with other, other agencies. So often what we need to do is look for programs that we know are effective, um, but we actually have the capacity to change. And so often that's about changing your objective to um, moving it from the aspirational to the achievable. And so often that's just about changing your frame of reference so that um, you're selecting a program you can implement and will have and it will have a beneficial impact on a particular group in a particular setting at a particular point in time. Um, and as well as the kind of decision grids that I mentioned before, having a good understanding about what else is happening in your community so that you can kind of patch a hole that needs that, that is currently left unaddressed, uh, or work, you know, hitch your carriage to another organisation so that you can value add. Uh, to what uh, is already occurring in the community to increase that impact are often good strategies that we, we often turn to. <coughs> okay. Thank you.